Hello class, uh, today I'm going to do a pre-lab about analyzing the pop and popcorn. This is assignment number 59. The purpose of today's lab is to determine the percent of water in popcorn and use the ideal gas law to determine the pressure inside the kernel when it pops. So what this means is we're going to actually use the ideal gas law to figure out what is the pressure of water inside a popcorn kernel just before it pops. So this must mean that when popcorn pops, it gets heated, there's some moisture inside the popcorn, uh, popcorn kernel that begins to become water vapor, and when it tries to burst out, it actually causes uh, the popcorn kernel to pop. Um, the goal will then be, of course, to calculate its pressure, and we already know that pressure, for instance, is PV equals nRT is the ideal gas law, and we're going to try to figure out the pressure, so we'll remember that at the end of the day, we're going to be trying to solve for the pressure of the water, so we'll be probably be using this equation. Now there's some safety information here. Obviously today you do need to wear your uh, safety goggles and lab aprons because you are heating oil and it can splatter. Um, first I would like you, before we move on, I would like you to go, for, go forward and read these procedures 1 through 13 as to what the procedure is for the lab today. I will actually show you sort of some visual uh, representations of the lab, but please take the next two minutes to go ahead and read um, how this lab should go. Now while you're reading, I'll go ahead and erase the ideal la gas law equation, and I'm going to make a few notations with the reading. The first thing is that Question or procedure seven and eight are pretty much done. These are set up in your lab area already. So keep that in mind. The other thing is be careful when you're actually using the burner. So this is number 10. It uses the word slowly. I want you to take that to heart. Um, if you set the Bunsen burner too close and have direct flame on the flask for the entire time, you will tend to get a black flask. And we want to avoid that. Okay? Flask. Can't spell today. Black flask. So it'll make, make a little bit of a mess and it'll make your cleanup, which is right here, a little bit more difficult. The aluminum foil, if you can possibly, we can reuse it. So think about trying to reuse the aluminum foil, but you must throw the popcorn in the garbage. Make sure you wash the flask, which hopefully you don't burn too much and the graduated cylinder which you use several times be sure that you wash this uh, very thoroughly with soap and water now I'll give you 30 more seconds to again briefly go through the procedure with me not talking So today you will use two different kinds of popcorn. You can use either white or yellow. Just pick one and note it in your data table for the type of or brand of popcorn that is either white or yellow. And you'll have to count out exactly 20 kernels of either white or yellow popcorn. Now if you look at your data table, 
one of the first things it asks you to do is get the weight of the weigh boat. So this is the weigh boat. I've marked it here with the red arrow. And I just want you to know I don't want you to throw those away. They can be reused. And the lab actually asks that you weigh the weigh boat and then you go and add your 20 kernels and then re-weigh that. The idea being the difference between the empty weigh boat and the one with the 20 kernels would obviously give you the weight of the um, unpopped kernels. However, instead of doing that, you can also, if you prefer, to simply put the weigh boat on the balance and use the tear functionality, which we've talked about before, and then put the 20 kernels of corn in, and that'll give you the weight straight up of the 20 kernels of corn. You can either fill in the data tables the way you'd like with the first two, or you could do this. The bottom line is you simply need to answer question one of the calculations, which is what are the weight of the unpopped kernels. Once you've recorded the weight of your unpopped kernels, or the mass in grams, your next task is to get the volume of those kernels, and we do this by using the water displacement method. So we do this by taking our 10 mil graduated cylinder, We take this graduated cylinder, which should be in your bench area, and we want to fill it about half full. You need to record your volume, again, to the nearest 0 0.1 mil. So even if you have it right on 5, you should record 5.0, not 5. Once you have that um, volume, then you simply put your 20 popcorn kernels into the water and of course the water level should rise by the exact volume of those popcorn kernels. Keep in mind the difference between this new volume and the volume you just measured should be the volume of the actual popcorn kernels. Now there are a number of potential errors you can make here. So some of those errors include, for instance, reading the volumes wrong. For instance, a lot of you don't recognize that there's five tick marks between each milliliter, which means each mark is 0.2 mils. Oftentimes I'll see it over 7.2, the first mark, but you'll record 7.1, so keep that in mind. Uh, the other one is that you maybe don't read at the bottom of the meniscus. Or perhaps you understand that you have to read at the bottom of the meniscus, but you don't get at eye level, so you suffer the problem of parallax, and you get an er erroneous reading of the volume. And finally, when you actually put the um, popped, unpopped kernels into the um, water, it's possible that you might actually kick some of the water up out of the out of the grad cylinder, even a bunch of it on the sides that could affect the results. So keep all of those potential errors um, in mind. I, I actually think that generally a lot of these labs, it's errors in um, measuring the volume which lead to the, to the largest um, error overall in the final calculations. Next you want to empty out your graduated cylinder. Make sure you don't lose any of your uh, popcorn kernels and then make sure the kernels are dried well. So your next step is to actually get the cooking oil that you will need to actually pop the corn. So the cooking oil we're using is vegetable oil, and here's just the big container of it, of it showing you what it is. Uh, that is the vegetable oil that was used. Okay. However, you won't be using this large container I've taken the liberty of taking some of this vegetable oil and putting it in a smaller container that should be outfitted with a transfer pipette. And your goal will be, then be to transfer approximately 2 mils of the vegetable oil with the transfer pipette into your graduated cylinder. Make sure not to throw the transfer pipette away. It can be reused. And make sure to clean up any mess you make, obviously, with the vegetable oil. 
Now simply take your 250 milliliter Erlenmeyer flask. It'll either be laying at your bench top or perhaps it'll be on the uh, clamped to your ring stand via a flask clamp. But take that um, and make sure it's clean and add your 20 kernels and your 2 mils of oil and you'll get the mass of this flask with all of its contents. So the mass, the mass of the flask, the popcorn kernels, and the oil. You just want an all an entire mass of that. So tear it and then put the Erlenmeyer with the stuff on it and get its mass. So here's the equipment setup that should be at your bench, the ring stand, a flask clamp, which may or may not have the Erlenmeyer flask clamped in, a ring clamp, a wire gauze, and then your Bunsen burner should be set up underneath it. There should also be uh, strikers to start the burners at, this, at every other station at least. So again, um, a fairly complicated apparatus if you think about it to pop a little bit of popcorn. And then the actual things you will be adding are your Erlenmeyer flask. Um, there should be some aluminum foil on top. If possible, reuse this. The aluminum foil also should have a few uh, pencil marks put in it so that uh, air can escape. I mean, actually water vapor can escape. And of course at the bottom will be your popcorn and oil. So again, this apparatus should be set up at your station and ready to go. And again, the flask itself might start to get some burn marks on it. Uh, try to clean it as best you can. If it's clean and dry and there's some burnt on it, it won't be the end of the world. It should still work fine. Here's simply a front view of your apparatus, looking at it as you would look at it head on, head on straight up. Remember, as you look at the the gas outlet right here, right now both positions are in the closed position. And to open it, you would need to turn it to this position where the, the uh, handle on the gas, gas outlet is actually in, in line with the hose. So right here it's in line. It's actually perpendicular to the hose would mean it's on and then pushing it back would mean that it's closed again. So now we're back in the closed position. Again, this is the closed position. Now this is probably the way you want to actually heat your popcorn and make your popcorn pop. Notice I don't have the Bunsen burner directly below here. So I don't have the flame just sitting here, okay, and actually just constantly heating. In order to avoid burning, I would just hold the, the bottom of the burner with my hand and gently go back and forth over underneath the, um, the uh, flask, the bottom of the flask until it pops. This probably will limit the amount of burning that actually occurs. So if everything goes well, you'll start to see popcorn kernels make their way in here and fill up. Um, there should only be 20 of them, so not a, a lot. You may get a few old maids, and some people might try and try and try to get those to pop, but if you think about it a little bit, I'm not necessarily sure having an old maid will upset your your um, results. So let me pose the following question. So the question is, will any old maids, which are unpopped kernels, affect your results? Why or why not? I've placed a four there because I want you to actually write this in on the back page and make this question number four um, for your analysis question. So rather than three analysis, analysis questions, you'll have four. Again, write this question down. Will any old maids, unpopped kernels, affect your results? Why or why not? So I want you to think long and hard about that and add that to your analysis questions. One more time, because I know some of you 
are a little slow. Question number four on your analysis question, so that should be on the back uh, side um, at the very end of your data. Make question number four, will any old maids affect your results? Why or why not? So I actually want you to explain why or why not. And just also a quick safety note, make sure that once you're done heating and you've turned off your Bunsen burner, that you let this sit at least, at least 10 minutes to make sure it's cooled down and you don't burn yourself when you go to re-weigh the Erlenmeyer flask now, which has the um, unpopped, I mean the unpopped kernels have become popped kernels, so now you're weighing the popped kernels with the um, oil and everything that was in there afterwards, okay? So keep that in mind. Make sure it cools down. So let's look at the back side of our data table and just let's really quickly look at um, how we're going to go about filling this information out. So first of all, for brand of popcorn used, you just want to write either white or yellow. So right here you want to write white or yellow for brand of popcorn. So no big deal. So the next data that you're going to use is these um, that you're going to fill in are these next two boxes, the mass of the weigh boat and the mass of the kernels in the weigh boat. Ultimately with this, either if you teared it from the beginning or if you recorded these two values and then subtract them, what you want is the mass of the kernels and ultimately that is goes under um, number one down below here calculations calculate the mass of the kernels in grams okay so again uh, you may have recorded the mass of your weigh boat and then you might have written that down and then recorded the mass of the kernels in the weigh boat a simple subtraction of those two would give you the mass of the kernels and that's really what you're going to show for number one how you got that or you could say, oh, I simply teared the balance and got a mass of And so you're not actually doing a calculation. In a sense, the balance did the calculation for you. So the next calculation that we need to, to get from, from our data is the actual volume of the kernels. And so if you look, we have the volume of the water in milliliters, and then we then added the kernels and got a new volume. So for instance, we might have been around 5.0 milliliters. We added the 20 kernels, and the water displacement maybe put it up to you know 8.6, and so you subtract 8.6 from you're starting 5.0, so then you'd get 3.6 milliliters. And so you would use that subtraction then to calculate the volume of the kernels in liters. Keep in mind that what they're actually asking for is the volume in liters. So if, for instance, you get a value of, let's say, 3.9 milliliters, you need to be able to convert that to liters. So you need to be able to convert that to liters to get that data for number two. So again, calculation number two utilizes the fourth and fifth boxes of the data table to actually get the volume of the kernels. Again, in liters. Now our last calculation utilizes the final two pieces of data that you collected in the lab. Remember you weighed the mask of the flask, the oil, and the unpopped kernels, and you got a mass, and then you went ahead and heated it, the flask, the oil, and, and you, pop, you got popcorn, and now you let that cool for 10 minutes, and then you got a new mass. The thought is that the mass should be less because what's left that flask is basically the water or the um, the the water that was inside the the unpopped kernels was heated, turned to steam, and blew out into steam and left out the top of through the aluminum foil, and so you have less mass. So it would seem that a simple subtraction of those two numbers, subtracting the final data point from the other data point, 
should give you a number that simply equals the grams of water lost. Okay, And so once you do that, you'll get um, that simple subtraction. You'll get the mass of the water lost. If, for instance, you somehow have a larger number here, this number is larger than the one above it, um, that's a bad sign. Something went wrong in your lab. Um, truth is, is that the top number should be bigger and this number here should be smaller. The difference is water lost to the atmosphere when you pop the corn. And you know this, when you pop a bag of popcorn, you open it up, you see the steam come out from the, even from the microwave. That's the water that had originally been inside of the popcorn kernel. So your next calculation is to calculate the percent of water in the popcorn. And what I've done is set up this equation which shows you that it's actually the answer you obtained in number three divided by the answer you obtained in number one times 100%. If you analyze this, in number three is the actual mass of water lost from the popcorn. In number one is the mass of the kernels in grams. So this was the total amount of popcorn kernels that you actually had before you popped them. So it was the corn and the water. That was what you basically calculated number one. In number three is basically you're calculating, you've calculated how much water was lost. And so it's the mass of the water divided by the mass of the, the, of the unpopped popcorn. That will give you your percent H2O once you multiply that by 100%. So the last thing that we're asked to calculate is the actual pressure in atmospheres, ATMs is the unit we're going to use, of what the water was when you actually, when the popcorn actually popped. And this is a classic example of where you need to use the ideal gas law, which is PV equals NRT, which is pressure times volume equals the moles of the substance, in this case water, times R, R is the universal gas constant. In this case, we want to use the number 0 0.0821. And T is the temperature. Again, remember, temperature has to be in Kelvin. And what I've just done is I've taken the liberty here to rearrange this equation, to rearrange it such that, I'll circle this, that the equation we'll actually use is P equals nRT over V, because we're solving for P, so I divide both sides by V. And so really what we need to do is we just have to get the four variables. What does N equal? What does R equal? What does T equal? And then finally, what does V equal? Once we have those four variables, we can go ahead and um, make our calculations. So the first variable I've just written down is R equals 0 0.0821. This is what we're going to use, and of course it's a constant, so this is the easiest of the four variables to get down. The next pretty simple variable to get is actually T, the temperature, because they sort of give it to you down here. They say well, assume that the boiling point of the cooking oil is 225 degrees Celsius. Oops, so you may be tempted to write 225 here. But keep in mind that we have to get that to degrees Kelvin, 225 degrees Celsius to degrees Kelvin, in order to do the calculation appropriately. Now the next variable that in and of itself really again is not too difficult to get, however, you know, you could make an error because you made errors in the lab, is to actually get the volume 
um, that was used in the in the lab. And the volume that we're going to use is what we did here in two. We calculated the volume of the kernels in liters. That's kind of interesting because the assumption is that the moisture inside the kernel when it explodes is basically approximately occupying the same volume as a kernel. Um, for instance, that might not be the case if more of the water was really in a smaller pocket inside the kernel. So this could be a source of air, but we're going to assume that the volume of the kernels is approximately um, the volume of the water when it actually burst out of the kernels. And just keep in mind, again, I won't give you the answer here. Oops, did it again. But remember, this must be in liters, whatever this number is, not mLs, milliliters. And the actually the last um, value that you need to get, which is a little bit more tricky, is N, which in this case is not the mass of the water in grams, but the moles of water. So N should be the moles of water that you used. That's the only way this equation will work. Now if you look to number three, we actually calculated the mass of water lost. So your data will have given you this number, mass of water lost. You need to use mole city and do a mole conversion to get from mass of H2O down to moles of H2O. And that would be the number that you use. So again, you'll simply take all these numbers and plug them into the equation, which will be P equals NRT over V. Um, they actually make the point in the very bottom down here that you used 20 kernels and so once you get this pressure here you'll actually need to divide that by 20 to get the pressure of water in one kernel. Right now all this is giving you for 20 of uh, the pressure for 20 you'll have to um, actually divide that by 20 so that you get the actual pressure for one kernel to pop. And finally, uh, don't forget the analysis questions. There's three of them, and then remember I added a fourth analysis question. And the fourth analysis question had to do with the old maids. Okay. This lab will be basically, each of those questions will be worth one point. Overall, the lab will be worth, I'll write that right here, 15 points. It's not due next week because you're on vacation. However, it'll be due the following Wednesday or Thursday after you return from vacation, depending on um, which day you had the lab. So this wraps up the pre-lab. I know it's a little long, but we had a lot to go over. And so I just hope that you have an enjoyable lab. You don't start any fires. And one more thing that I need to tell you. Have fun.